I'm joined today by Cullen Bunn, New York Times bestseller, writer of novels, comics, and short stories, comic book writer for Marvel, DC, and everyone else, and one of the busiest writers in the business. Cullen, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you, and thanks for that intro. You actually made me uh, feel like I had accomplished something. <laughs> you, you definitely have, and I have to mention as well the flat cap, which is much appreciated. I would say I did it just for you, but uh, but no, this ad is a way of life. That's what editing is for, my friend. Uh, in the edit, it'll, it'll all, all you you hear is that little bit where you say i did it just for you i did it just for you so i wanted to start with where you are at the moment there is a certain perception about what it is like to be you know a well-known author or a successful writer what what does your day-to-day look like what's the reality of being in your um in your position uh so it, it varies uh it's it's never quite the same so in that i'm never working on the same thing i don't have a set thing i'm working on every day but i can tell you that i work from about eight o'clock in the morning until about six at night every day every day i work maybe an hour or two at night my hobbies right now are working on stories so when i so when i sit down and, and i'm just gonna relax and do something i'm gonna work on one of my stories so there's a lot of hours that go in there and i treat it very much like a a, you know, a full-time job. And I know there are going to be people out there that say, oh, don't glorify overworking. And they're absolutely right. I'm not glorifying overworking. Don't do what I do, but this is what works for me. That's how I treat my my day-to-day. It's what I like to do. It's how I like to spend my time. I spend time with my family, my kid, my wife, but free time is dedicated to writing for me. And when I say that, some of it's writing, but a lot of it's outlining, a lot of it's responding to emails or doing accounting work. That's when I say it changes from day to day. How do you feel then on those days where you get caught up in admin, promotion, business calls, all that sort of stuff, and you don't get to writing? It can feel a little uh, like I've been a little unproductive. And I, I don't love those. I don't love that feeling, especially if deadlines are looming. So I know that I've got something that's due in the next couple of days. In the best of circumstances, the best of worlds, if I can write five pages of comics a day, I'm on schedule for everything I do. And five pages isn't a lot as long as you're not overwhelmed with phone calls and meetings and trying to chase down money and everything else that goes with being a a writer. Are you the kind of writer that will have four or five projects going at the same time? I'd be very nervous if I were only working on four or five projects at a time. (laughs) I, I I would not like that feeling at at all. I want, I need more than that. I don't want to say how many I feel comfortable with. I, I need more projects than that going on at one time. Now, I typically I work on a project and I focus on that project and, you know, I have a I have a daily plan. This is what I need. You know, this is what I should be working on. Sometimes I bounce back and forth, but typically when I'm writing a script, for instance, I'll focus on that script until it's done. I might go out at the, in the evening and sit at a bar and outline a couple of another, a couple of issues of another project, but my main focus in writing would be that script. I would be very nervous if I were only working on four or five projects at a time. I like to know what's next. I don't ever want to be working on a project and look to the future and say, oh, I don't have anything next. I would be terrified if that were the case. So I like knowing what's next. I like creating stories. So I'm always developing new ideas. Uh, So there are a lot of ideas that are in various stages at any given time. I've said this elsewhere, and I think people think I'm being facetious when I say it, but I'm not. I also live with the certainty that this is all going to go away. There will come a day when this doesn't work for me anymore. It won't work. I can't make a living and it's gone. So I want to create what I can while I can. And that keeps a little bit of a fire burning. Creators need to understand the reality of it is before I became a full-time writer, I was a vice president of marketing and I left that job, jumped with both feet into being a writer and I've never looked back and I've always been happy. Financially, I've always done okay. I've done pretty, I've done better than I did as a vice president of marketing every year, except one, which I made less than I did make as a college student working part-time at a Dairy Queen. That's a brutal reality. That year was really hard. That year impacted me for several years to come. It took a while to recover from, from that. It's just the nature of being a freelance writer. I thought I was busy. I thought I was being, I thought I was pretty busy that year. And uh, apparently I was busy on the wrong things. (laughs) So where did it all, all start with you? When did you first think, hang on, this is something I, I, I like and I can do? Well, I, you know, I feel like I always, since I was very young, I was always telling stories. I was always fascinated by telling stories. I was drawing my own comics and writing my own comics. 
I was passing them out to my friends in in school. I, my dad had a copy machine in his office, so I would I was taking them. I was making copies of my hand drawn comics and passing them out to my friends every Friday at school. And then a few years later, I was publishing them and going to. I was setting up at conventions with my mini comics and selling comics at conventions wow. for like twenty five cents a piece. And then I got into writing short fiction. I was really interested in that. So I, I just I've always wanted to tell stories, but and I don't care if it's comic book books, prose, TV, film. I don't care. I just want to tell stories that people will read. It took me a while to get there. It was a struggle, but it's what I always wanted to do. So now I'm going to hold on with, uh, <laughs> with, a, with a death grip until, uh, until it's gone. Nothing unusual about a 4 a.m. call to a back alley in downtown Kenton. A young woman lying pristine and unmarked on the cold, hard ground. I get to work quickly, but there's not much to go on here. No marks of any kind, no signs of struggle, just a dead Vic in the middle of an alley. And then there's that. A dead body in a dumpster that looks like a grizzly bear has crawled its way out of his stomach. How do you keep yourself motivated? Not to sound mercenary, but if I don't produce, my family doesn't eat. So uh, that that's a huge motivator. It used to be the only motivator that I needed, really. That and just a, a desire to tell stories. Within the last few years, I don't feel, you know, I've definitely lost a few steps in terms of motivation. There are days where I just like, oh, I just don't want to do this. I just can't do it. I've always said to myself, if you're not writing during work time, you're just going to sit in front of your computer. So I do. I sit in front of my computer and sometimes I just sit here like, you know, just, oh. sometimes I read a story that I love. I go and pick up a comic that that inspires me or something like that. Well, I'll watch a movie that gets the juices flowing and just anything to kind of kickstart that creativity again in order to, to get working. That's the that's the windmill I'm trying to tilt right now is to figure out how to always be motivated. Yeah, well, let me know when you, uh, <laughs> when you discover that one. The biggest amount of my creativity goes into comics right now. And the reason for that is I'm not very patient and comics turn quickly. A script gets written, I I start seeing art and that seeing the art, seeing the creative process, seeing someone interpreting the work is important to me. It, it helps me stay motivated. And then they hit the shelf and seeing people reading them and talking about it. I need that. You know, I love writing prose, but the weight is brutal. I know some creators who are in it for the act of creation. And I, I like the act of creation, but the biggest thing for me is having people read it and see it. And right now, comics, it's its a much more immediate gratification. So I have to recognize that for me, I need that in order to stay motivated. And that helps. If I'm really having trouble with comics, I can focus on writing the numerous novels I'm working on or whatever. I'll focus on that for a little bit. Focus on one thing that helps break blocks or break stagnation on others. Working with, you know, your Marvels and your DCs and those sort of well-known brands, how does that differ from working with smaller projects or your own project? It's it's drastically different. Working on those two different kinds of projects, they take very different skill sets. It's not just different from, you know, small public or indie, indie publishers to the big two. It's also different between editor to editor to editor. Um, so you have to learn how to adapt to all these things. The biggest thing with uh, a Marvel book or a DC book is that the editorial process, it's a lot more involved. And there are things that you have to deal with that usually have nothing to do with telling a good story. Let's say you're writing a story with Wolverine. You have to know what Wolverine's doing and all these other books and other editors have plans for Wolverine that they don't want you to do this story. So there's a lot of preparation, a lot of back and forth from the earliest stages. There's a lot more back and forth, a lot more discussion, sometimes knock down, drag out fights over what will make a decent story and what won't. And at the 
end, I can fight. I can rage against the machine. I can I can stomp and say this is what it needs to be to tell a great story. But I don't have final say. Stories will sometimes be very different than what I would want. While with creator own books, I have final say. I, along with my collaborative partners, we have final say on what it's going to be. Writing a, a creator own book for me goes a lot faster than writing a Marvel or a DC book. I'm always trying to hedge my bets when I'm working on a Marvel and DC book. I always have to really think, okay, what's going to get this one across the, the finish line or save me the, the most headaches? Plenty of times I'll write something and I'll, I'll say to myself, this is the best X-Men scene that's ever been written. And they are not going to let it happen. There is not a chance in hell that they let that scene get published. And I can, I can identify them now. I can identify those scenes so well. Then I have to ask myself the question, do I put it in there and try to make it happen? Or do I just realize that they're not going to go for the awesome scene and write a lukewarm version of that? It can be a little frustrating. Some aspiring creators, that's what they want to do. They want to tell stories about Spider-Man and the X-Men. And, and that's great. But just know that it, there's that's fine and dandy. Do it and do your best. Just know that you don't own those characters. You don't have final say on those characters. And you can be writing a great run on a book and you can be, whoop, you're off of it the next day you're done with that character forever. I feel a great sense of ownership to these characters that I write. Uh, so if I write a Magneto story, I start feeling ownership for Magneto. I start making plans. Oh, this is where I want this to go. And those plans are never going to see complete fruition. That's, that can be frustrating for me. And, and I have to recognize that that's a point of potential angst and heartbreak. What's your go-to to get a little bit of inspiration? What do you read? What do you watch? What's, what's your process for coming up with ideas? I do like to go on walks when the weather is nice. Walking on a treadmill doesn't do it. So I need to walk outside if I'm if to, to really get the, the ideas flowing. Reading short stories, sometimes stories I've read dozens of times. I'll read a short story that's inspirational to me for some reason. Ray Bradbury, in one of the essays in Zen and the Art of Writing, put out this idea that, you know, you write a title at the top of a page and you just start writing. You don't care about punctuation or language. You just start writing. You free write, you word vomit onto this page. And at about a page to a page and a half, a story or an idea surfaces. And I'll do that. I write myself in the corners all the time, despite all the outlines. I do. I still write myself into these terrible corners. And when I get into these corners, I'll sit down and I'll just start writing. And it might be Venom is fighting three villains that he has absolutely no possibility of defeating. They are too powerful for him. What am I going to do? And then I'll just start writing. Well, Venom was an idiot to get here. And I'll just start writing all these, you know, writing it out. And eventually in that writing process, the solution presents itself. And I'll say, there it is. That's the, the piece of the puzzle. And, and that is my favorite way to kind of solve problems or to brainstorm or to get rid of writer's block. That free writing for a little bit, it's sort of focused free writing because I usually it's a, you know, I'm posing a question or I've got a title at the top that I want to write about. That focused free writing will often solve all the problems. It shifts the gears in my brain so I'm less worried about, you know, how am I going to make this happen? And it's just you're thinking on on different things. And it works for me every almost every time. Your, your advice to a up and coming writer, someone wanting to get into the business, whether in, I want to write, I want to do that for a living, what would be the advice you would give someone if they were starting kind of now? Uh, I wish I'd have known this when I was starting. Don't wait for permission. Don't wait for someone to give you permission to create. Just do it. You don't have to have permission to tell stories. So just tell us, write your own stories. Do st things that are unique to you. That means if, you, if your dream is to write Spider-Man, you have to have permission you know, to actually get in the door at Marvel and write Spider-Man. You don't have to have permission to tell stories. So just tell us, write your own stories. Do st things that are unique to you. Publisher won't give you the time of day. Pursue self-publishing as an option. Pursue publishing online, crowdfunding. The most important thing, what I did, which I hated, which, which I hate, looking back on it, I hate. I would write pitch after pitch after pitch. And I'd send them out to publishers and no publisher would, would give me the time of day. I'd get rejections. So I didn't write those stories. I spent so much time sending out letters begging for work that I wasn't actually working. That's my biggest piece of advice. Don't, don't just wait for an editor or a publisher to say, yes, come to us. You can still be writing your stories. Write stories that are unique to you. Get them out there somehow. All right. Thank you, sir. We'll move on to the next section of the podcast, which is the worst pitch.
But basically, uh, a thousand babies are born at the same time on the same day all around the world that look and, and are completely genetically identical in every single way. Scientists start getting involved. What's going on? There's some sort of no other connection other than the fact that they're genetically perfect twins of each other. And then the scientists discover the cause of all of this. So basically, the way this is a film. So the first uh, hour and a half is the birth of these kids and then a scientist in a lab trying to figure out what's going on. Uh, and then they find that the, the answer is extraterrestrial DNA has been found and it's just a randy alien dude that came to uh came to earth impregnated a whole heap of people and then disappeared i don't think that's a terrible idea i mean i don't know how you pull that off in any medium but okay yeah <laughs> all right so titles are bad uh, titles are tough for me but since this is a bad one i don't care i'm calling this one the big switch so no, in the big switch universe a comet passes too close to the Earth, and the radioactivity from that comet causes a strange thing to happen. All of the giant monsters, the Godzillas, the Gamoras, the Space Godzillas, the Megalons, they shrink to so small, tiny sizes. But wait, there's more. All of the small <laughs> monsters, like the Ghoulies and the Gremlins and the Critters around the world, grow to giant size. The now small monsters, former giant kaiju, are so thrilled that they are no longer being hunted by missiles and masers and tanks that they go on a mischievous rampage, just having fun. Because that's all they ever wanted to do anyway. They were just too big to have fun. They were crushing, destroying stuff because they're just too big. But all the little monsters who are now gigantic are thrilled with their new status in life. And they genuinely go on a mischievous rampage page, but they're giant size and they're doing it on purpose and they're good at it. So they're very destructive. The people of Earth have to figure a way to coordinate. Well, I think the only way to end it is they have to put the now shrunken kaiju into the bloodstream of the now giant tiny monster. <laughs> in order to kill them. It writes itself. They're, they're, uh, I think you're going to need a little bit more practice to come up with a truly terrible pitch because that one, I can see that being made. It's a terrible idea, but the more, I, that's the problem is I think of these terrible ideas and I'm like, huh, that actually, yeah. that could work. <laughs>
things is that servant class. And it can either be sentient, self-aware AI robots or demon creatures that are shackled with uh, magical power. Which would you choose? And then after your choice, we will roll the dice figuratively speaking to see how that turns out. <laughs> Who comes up with these questions? Are these all you? <laughs> these are me. I like to put people on the spot that I would never have an answer for. Um, I think that mankind is served by a tiny by tiny wind up robots, and they Ooh. only work when you wind them up. So they only work for like twenty seconds at a time, and then you have to wind them back up. <laughs> so we all have RSI from from twisting. You, to, you just thing. have to keep winding little robot up and let it go. So you know you what you need your slippers. <laughs> Go get the slippers. And the little robot slowly walks on his little <laughs> windy legs and goes and picks up the slippers and comes back. But he probably runs out of juice about halfway to the slippers and definitely halfway back. Millions of them all over the world in yeah. our houses doing you stuff. Can't walk. You can't walk anywhere without them. Because I also feel like there are specially designed robots who wind up other robots. So you have to wind up the... That, yeah. Wind up one robot, and then it will go and wind your other robots up. And I'm picturing instead of you know, in traditional taxis, we have rickshaws that have robots at the front of them, <laughs> and also slow. not Very robots slow. with wheels. They don't have wheels; they have legs. They just have the legs. legs that move slowly. Yeah. yeah, that's what I like. All right. Well, that's that's a fantastic addition. So we're going to go with that, and I will uh, roll the dice and see what happens to the future of humanity. Here we go. Wow, this doesn't happen very often on this show. The wind-up clunky robots serve humanity on into the future because they don't have souls and they're not really super self-aware or they're only aware for 30 seconds at a time. We don't feel guilty about them. They're just machines. They don't ri rise up against us because they've only got 30 seconds worth of aggression anyway. <laughs> then they're done. Right. So it all ends up marvelously for the next thousand years or so for humanity. So well done, sir. You have uh, you have won for humankind. Well, that's, uh, that's what I do. I win for humankind. <laughs> Well done, sir. Well, thank you very much, Cullen, for joining us. It's been an absolute uh, pleasure talking with you today. Well, thanks for having me. I really appreciate it.